So we'll have our second talk for the afternoon. Given by Camilo de Laudis from the Institute of Advanced Study. They'll be talking to us about anomalous dissipation for the forest stitch. Bobby Stokes, a question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, the organizers, for inviting me to this um, famous center. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to uh, respect the tradition and uh, get extra time, but the clock over there says that it's 10.45. So I'm either awfully extra time or I'm very much early. <laughs> Either way. So uh, the talk is going to be about the Flavius uh, Stokes and Euler equations, which I'm writing for you over here. So V is a vector field, which is defined um, on time and space. So you have to think of omega as a subset of the d-dimensional Euclidean space. These are either two or three. And actually, for the purpose of this talk, you can think that omega is the periodic torus. OK? And um, the equations, you see them written over there. So the first equation is encoding the conservation of momentum, and the second equation is actually encoding the conservation of mass. Um, so, oops. So nu bigger than zero um, is, so nu is a real parameter. So if it is positive, we are talking about the Navier-Stokes equation. And if it is equal to zero, we are talking about the other equations. And the blue term, which is the linearity in this partial differential equation, is what is called the advective term. It's a given in components. So it's a vector. And I write it as the divergence of the matrix. It's given in component by that formula over there, although um, most likely you have written it uh, with, um, I mean, you've seen it written with like, you know, this um, component, which is like staying outside over here, which if you have a smooth vector field is just an effect of the divergence free condition. And uh, delta V is the usual proportion. So it's the sum of the um, homogeneous second order derivatives um, in the values coordinates. Okay, so, so these equations are, were derived very long ago, so the Euler equation more than 250 years ago, and the Navier Stokes equation in the 19th century. And they are supposed to describe the motion of an incompressible fluid, uh, but under some idealized uh, assumptions. So the first one, as I said, is that it's incompressible. And um, in the case of the Euler equations, you're assuming that there is absence of frictions between nearby fluid particles. So, so what this means is that if you have a layer of fluid which is sliding over another layer of fluid, there's actually no friction between them. So nothing actually stops your fluid from keep like you know moving in this way forever. Um, when there are the Navier Stokes equations, you're actually modeling friction in some way. So now if you have a layer of fluid which is sliding over another layer of fluid, uh, that is not going to uh, happen forever. Somehow the fluid is slowing down because there's some friction between the two layers. Um, to get to the Navier Stokes equation you're still making some assumptions about how uh, this friction depends on the motion. For instance, that it's linear in the velocity, that you have isotropy, and so on. But we not get into that. So the unknowns are the pressure, the uh, function which I denoted by p, and the velocity. So the velocity v at point x and t tells you what is the uh, speed of a fluid particle, which is occupying the position x at time t. Um, uh, the pressure is a more complicated object. So uh, the gradient of the pressure is a force, and you can think about it as a reaction of the fluid to the motion. So like there's a layer of, I mean, there's a, a certain amount of fluid which is trying to move in a certain space, but that space is occupied by some other fluid. And since you're actually incompressible, uh, that is a reaction from what is actually occupying that space. And that is encoded in this gradient of P. There are various ways of interpreting what gradient of P is. For instance, one very nice way of interpreting it is that it is a sort of Lagrange multiplier if you're actually understanding the other equations as a um, evolution in the space of different morphisms. But, but I'm not going to take actually that point to view uh, in the rest of the talk. So now, there's, um, by the way, the uh, density of the fluid is assumed to be constant, and um, just as mathematicians like to do, we just set that constant to be equal to 1. Okay, physicists don't like that, because that, con that constant comes with a certain measurement, dimension, and whatever, but, well, that's life. So now, if you have a, um, a sufficiently regular solution, so uh, just one derivative actually uh, is enough, you can scalar multiply the first equation by V itself, and you can carry on some computations which are elementary calculus computations, which I already did for you. So you find that the uh, time derivative of the modulus of V squared divided by 2, which, if you think that this is multiplied by the density, is just the 
um, kinetic, um, is the kinetic energy density, okay? So that time that you got it is equal to uh, this divergence term, which is a flux, and this term, which is a dissipating term. Actually, this one is also a flux. What is really dissipating is this um, term, which, get, which gets with a minus, with a with a negative sign. Okay. So now that C one is enough. It's actually obvious for new equals zero because you don't have to take second derivatives like over there. It's less obvious for when new is positive, but it's something that you can actually. Um, um, give as a meaningful exercise to students if they uh, are told a certain amount of the higher amount. Enough for what? Enough for justifying this identity. Oh. Okay. As we will see, actually, this identity is literally false if you drop into regularity. It's an out. If you drop the regularity of V and P, this identity is actually false. If you do what? If you drop the regularity. So the C1 regularity is necessary for that identity to, uh, if you get to Herder below one over three. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So Lipschitz is still okay, and yeah, Lipschitz is still okay, and even below Lipschitz is still okay, which is a, a rather non-trivial theorem. But then at a certain point, it stops being true. Okay, now if you integrate in space, and it's assumed to be on the periodic torus, so you can just integrate by parts all divergence turns and they drop. Okay? Then you can deny this identity. So this identity, which has a mistake because there's a factor one half which is missing over here. Huh? So this identity tells you that the time derivative of the total kinetic energy now of the fluid is actually a negative number, right? So it's dissipated by this friction. Uh, of course, that is if mu is positive. So if mu is equal to zero, of course this term drops, and you just find that the kinetic energy is preserved under the flow, which is very natural because there's no external force which is acting and there's no dissipation through viscosity. Okay, so now if you go to high Reynolds number, and in, in our setting, a high Reynolds number, you can simply think of getting this mu somehow sufficiently small. So if you have small viscosity, and um, let, let us write down somehow the equation in the... For those who are here, I mean, high Reynolds number means an active fluid, right? Yes, it's, a, it's somehow... It, it's, it's, so it, 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 it means literally that uh, the viscosity is small compared to some, like, you know, relative motion of... Uh, I mean, the relative size of the motion of the fluid, so, yeah. Um, so... This E of T, so the, your, your equation is telling the E prime of T is equal to Q of T. Um, and there's um, a Kolmogorov's theory of fully developed turbulence, K41, is usually a dot, which predicts that, in fact, this um, right-hand side, Q of T, should be independent of mu for a typical solution. And you even have a scaling that you're... Um, supposed to find typically for solutions that Q of T is actually depending like a certain constant times uh, the um, um, 3 over 2 power of the kinetic energy. Okay? Can you explain how that's possible? Because it's obviously not independent of mu. So what do you mean? So what I mean by this, I'm, I'm just going, to, I'm just going to propose a way to understand this. Okay? okay? Um, well, I don't understand it, but let, let me just propose a way to like, um, say that at least mathematically this can be proved to happen. Okay, so there's a large theory about, uh, there, there, there's a lot of work about the theory of turbulence, and um, uh, yeah, the typical, the typically physicists and, and uh, applied mathematicians are interested in much more complicated uh, questions. But, so let me just tell you what you would expect from this uh, uh, basic tenet. So you would expect, of course, to find the sequence of viscosity which are going down to zero, uh, a sequence of solutions to the flow which have bounded kinetic energy, uh, but so that the right hand side, which is accounting for the dissipation, is going to be bounded away from zero, even though the viscosity is going down to zero. Okay, so this is bound to happen in some way. But so it's still losing energy. But it's still losing energy but even it's not supposed to, to from the equation. From the equation, it's not supposed to if you have enough regularity because you would have conservation of the energy. But actually, this should. If, if you're converging to a nice solution of the other equation, and somehow this is going to be the punchline of my talk. Now, you have to pay attention, though. So, um, 
So all of this has to be done without, so let, let us imagine that you're producing these flows by starting from some initial data for the number of Stokes equations, okay? So now I could do something kind of fake in this. I could actually introduce a lot of oscillation in my initial data and force a scenario like this, which is not what the theory of turbulence is telling you. So this should happen without actually you forcing the initial data with a lot of oscillations. So what, what I mean by this is the following. So let us take, let us take just the um, uh, navier stokes equations and let us drop the blue term. So now it becomes the linear Stokes equation. Now, if you're looking at the linear Stokes equation and you start with an initial data which is divergence free, it actually reduces to the heat equation. You're not seeing the gradient of the pressure, okay? So, now it becomes the heat equation. And now, if I take, even for the heat equation, oscillatory initial data, I mean, for instance, if I take this initial data over here, you can compute explicitly your solution by using the heat uh, flow semi-group. And this is your explicit solution. And you see that there is this square root of nu over here. So when I'm actually going to compute the gradient of V nu squared, I mean, this 1 over square root of nu comes down here, squared, and it cancels with that nu. So you're just going to see a total dissipation, which is this thing over here. Okay? And it's a constant, and it's a constant which is independent of nu. But that's not what's supposed to happen in the theory of turbulence. It's not like you're like igniting so many oscillations in the initial data. Uh, you're not doing that, and nonetheless, the, um, the, um, uh, the equations are dissipating for you. So there's something which must happen because uh, there is the blue term over there. So it's something that must happen because there is this blue term, this new linearity, which is somehow creating the finer and finer scales which finally are dissipated by uh, uh, your finite viscosity. Okay, so that's the mechanism that you're trying to capture. Okay, so now coming to uh, the observation of Dennis, so if actually your sequence of solutions with vanishing viscosity is converging to a classical solution of Euler, then Q of V nu K is converging to zero. The energy, just the energy doesn't get dissipated. I mean, in the limit, the, the energy stays constant, right? So for such a thing to happen for some meaningful sequence, without igniting somehow a lot of oscillations at the beginning, you must have some sort of kind of reasonable initial data which is creating a reasonable solution of Dani Stokes, but when you actually let the viscosity go to zero, you're not converging to a smooth solution of uh, oil. Okay. Okay. So by and large, what is the, 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 the threshold for a reasonable classical solution of Euler that you know to exist is essentially Lipschitzianity of your vector field. So Lipschitzianity of the vector field, Lipschitz regularity of the vector field. So if you start with an initial data, which is a little bit better than Lipschitz, Euler has a unique solution in that regularity class, which is enough to actually say that the um, total kinetic energy is conserved. You mean for a fixed amount of time? Or? For a fixed amount of time, because of course you have the blow-up problem. Okay? So, um, in fact, you can be even kind of very abstract um, so this is, uh, I mean, this is like the stability of Euler and Nagy Stokes is a very well studied uh, subject, and there's like you know decades of um, works in PDEs. But you can even just prove some sort of abstract theorem, which is not even using any uh, sort of well closeness of the of the PDEs. So as soon as you have a classical solution of Euler, and by classical I mean it's Lipschitz, you can actually even go a little bit below. So in this theorem that I'm citing of uh, myself and my co-authors, you just need the uh, symmetric part of the derivative to be uh, n1 in time bounded in space. So as soon as you have that, and you have that the kinetic energy is under control, then for any sequence of viscosity is going to zero, and for any sequences of Lyrae solutions, uh, you don't know the theory of, like, you know, like weak solutions of Navier Stokes, just imagine classical solutions or smooth solutions of, of Navier Stokes, are actually forced to converge to that solution over there. Okay? If I start with the same initial data. So, and once I'm actually forced to, to, to converge to that solution over there, that one preserves the kinetic energy, and I cannot have this typical turbulent scenario, which is telling you that the uh, uh, energy uh, dissipation rate stays 
fixed or at least bounded away from zero, as the viscosity is going down. Okay? So, so any, any weak array solutions converge to the yes. actual solution? Yes, yes. And I. So, Moray, when he was age 26, wrote this paper yes. in 1937. And if you read that paper, you can talk to these guys as pretend you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> the fast way. Well, some people, well, I have, I mean, I'm not telling you the name of a person who said that, but, you know, there would be, like, one person who would have the statement, like, nothing else was proved since the day on this no, subject. So, <laughs> essentially, you are an expert in there. <laughs> Even for some experts. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, that's, 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 that's proof, but some yeah. conceptual broad yes. sense. It's yes, broad that's sense. very, that's very provocative. Um, so, okay, what would be now the idea uh, that you might have for producing, like, you know, this, an example of anomalous dissipation? So here, it's, it's very important that um, I, I stress this. So, this behavior is expecting very widely, and I'm just chasing after a single mathematical example. I mean, a single example for which I can actually prove you with pen and paper from you know, start to finish that this happens, okay? Um, so one idea you could have is, well, let yeah, me try to prove what? To prove that there is a sequence of oh. solutions to the stocks with the viscosity which is going down to zero, which has non-trivial dissipation, which is independent of the viscosity, and I don't allow you to put a lot of oscillation in the initial data. Okay. If you really constrain me to like giving you a condition, like the sequence of initial data that you're using has to be strongly compact in a two, for instance. Yeah. Like, you know, the minimal, the minimal so, assumption so, that I want you to take. Even though it's observed in all numerical experiments, you don't have a rigorous discussion of such an example. Exactly. Okay. Not that I know of. Yeah. So one idea that you, would, um, that, that you might use to produce such example could be, let me just, you know, as I, as I advocated, such a sequence has to converge to a dissipative solution of the oil equations. Well, not necessarily. Maybe it does not even converge to a solution of the oil equations. But if it converges, it has to converge to something which dissipates the energy from the oil equation. So I could try to, dis to, to produce such an object in the limit, and then hope to perturb Euler to Navier Stokes and like, you know, to produce a sequence of solutions which is doing that to Navier Stokes. I was first just get the, the sequence and then perturb it to get the solution. No, the other way around. First, take a solution of the limiting equation, which is dissipating energy, so a crazy solution of Euler, and then try to approximate it. Okay? That's one way you could try to approach the problem. Now, as it turned out in the last, say, 10, 15 years, there's actually an extremely uh, efficient uh, technology to construct dissipative solution of the Euler equations, or like, you know, weak solutions of the Euler equations, which do a lot of crazy things. Uh, and you're done by... They're, they're crazy, but they still decrease the energy. They still decrease the energy, and they're maybe not that crazy because we can produce them to be, for instance, Hölder regular. Because, because we can produce them Hölder regular. Oh, Hölder regular. So, you're not totally irregular. And um, so this method goes by the name of convex integration, which was a friend of mine told me once, it's good to, uh, to say it's convex integration because it was invented by Romov, it sells better. So, I mean, it has a lot of common things to what um, uh, was introduced by Misha in geometry, and which it goes under the name of convex integration or H principle, but, you know, if you look at it from some other points of view, I mean, there's lots of differences. Well, I have a question about that. Yes. Romov wrote these notes on convex integration long ago, partial differential relations. I yes. Think they, they weren't looked at by the by the experts in partial differential equations for a long time. Yes. Like 20, 25 years. Like yes. Years. And I can tell you that you can still look at those, and I don't think they would help you understanding our proofs anyway that much. Okay. I mean, it's really like, you know, look, look, I mean, if you, if you look at it from very far away, there is some common thread. But when you actually go into the proofs, the stuff that we're doing is generally different. But there's lots of common ideas that, that you know, there's, there's, there's so lots the of common thing. philosophy. It's not the same thing. Okay. It's not the same thing, no. I mean, we're not really using these methods to produce this type of solutions. But do you have some concrete examples which would satisfy saying your framework doesn't satisfy the vicious framework? Do you have like 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, for, I mean, for instance, one of the questions that he asks in, that he asks in the book is, um, you know, all, all the examples that, that he's producing by a convex integration are essentially like one-dimensional perturbations. And the convex integration schemes that we use, they actually use multi-dimensional perturbations. You wouldn't be able to prove some of the theorems that we can prove by only going and perturbing, like, you know, with one-dimensional things. Okay. I mean, it depends. It depends on what you actually understand as philosophy. So I could even just advocate that you know the convex integration scheme, or even what Nash does, and so on. It's a very sophisticated version of how Weierstrass produces a continuous function, which is nowhere differential. It's by adding oscillations in a very specific way so to make something go wrong. I mean, if you look at it from that point of view, you would say, okay, the precursor of everything was like bias right. But when you actually then go down to the details, you start seeing like, you know, different and different. So, I mean, it depends on like, you know, which level of detail you, you look at. And I mean, if you're thinking that like, you know, you learn Misha stuff and then, and, you know, you're going to apply it and, and get one of our theorems, that is certainly wrong. You have to understand it. <laughs> no, no, I mean, not even understanding what he's doing, you're going to get out of that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a different PDE problem. I mean, when you then try to, like, you know, use some even just, like, um, high-level ideas to produce these solutions, there's still some PDE mechanisms that you have to understand which are more complicated. That's what um, I would like. Okay, so what do we understand as solutions of order which do not preserve the kinetic energy? So, they understood distributionally, so for instance, in the way uh, Dennis suggested. But another way to understand that, if you don't like the theory of distributions, is just to say that you have conservation of mass and momentum in their integral forms. So let me just explain you what I mean by that. By the way, the existence of dissipative solutions of the oil equations was actually postulated by a famous uh, 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 theoretical physicist, by Lars von Sager in 1949. So way before all of this happened. Okay, so here what I mean. So the balance of mass is that the flux of fluid leaving entering omega through the boundary of, uh, of omega is actually equal to zero, right? So you can write this as the integral of v dot mu is equal to zero over the boundary. So that's a way to say that the vector field as divergence is divergence free, right? So if the vector field were smooth, you would integrate by paths and integrate over omega divergence of b equal to zero. And if that has to be true for every omega, then divergence of b has to vanish everywhere, right? So if you see one, this is equivalent to say that you're divergence free. But you can write down this identity if you're continuous. And you can just postulate that that one is what it means to be divergence free. You can do something similar for the conservation of momentum, which is the second equation. So it, it amounts to know that this identity, in which you're not taking any special derivatives, um, holds for every domain omega, which is reasonably uh, um, smooth, okay? Okay, and you can see that these integral identities actually make sense if V and P are just continuous functions. Okay, so now how, how are they constructed? So we, um, and, and we is uh, Laszlo Zekaihidi and, and myself, so, uh, invented this type, uh, convex integration type methods to generate irregular solutions of the incompressible Euler equations, we were trying to reproduce and go beyond examples which existed already in the literature in the 90s by Schaeffer and Schneiderman. And as we were inspired by the literature on differential inclusions, um, which is a completely different um, um, sector of uh, partial differential equations, by Nash, C1 is a magnetic embedding theory, and by Gromov's H principle. What is a differential inclusion? So differential inclusion is uh, a PDE of the type the derivative of a map belongs to a certain set. Oh. Let me give you a very simple differential inclusion. So the Cauchy-Riemann equation is a differential inclusion. So the derivative of the map U, which goes from R2 to R2, is a conformal matrix pointwise. And, you know, measure preserving, which means the determinant is positive. So, depending on which type of PDE you're looking at, you might actually end up studying something which has an elliptic flavor, but you might actually end up something which has a very different flavor. So, it's a very general system of partial differential equations. 
Okay, so these ideas were greatly improved, actually, in the last 15 years, and there is a whole bunch of people who worked on that. And let me just tell you the two most striking achievements. So, um, the proof of the Unsager conjecture in fully developed turbulence, so that tells you precisely that for a weak solution of Euler, there is a regularity threshold which allows you that solution to be possibly dissipative. And this regularity threshold is exactly 1 over 3. So Holder, if Holder exponent. Holder exponent is 1 over 3. And this was conjectured by Unsager. So you wouldn't rougher, even. Rougher than that. Rougher than that, it can dissipate. Yeah. It can. It might even not. Yeah. But uh, more smooth than that, it actually has to conserve the energy. And that was put forward in this 1949 paper by Lars Unsager. And then there is this paper by Buckmaster and Pico, which says that. Um, distributional solutions of Navier Stokes are actually imposed. This is what I was telling you before, is giving you that this condition of Lere on distributional solution is non empty. So there are distributional solutions of Navier Stokes which don't satisfy the energy uh, uh, inequality. By the way, I, I, I said something wrong. So I said that um, the, the um, being a Lere solution is equivalent to have the um, uh, dissipation of the energy, but, but not the identity which I wrote down, the inequality. So it might dissipate even more than what is told you by uh, um, the right hand side. Okay? Now, one thing which is, however, pretty bad is that these weak solutions are very irregular, and when you try to actually approximate them by classical solution of, of Navier Stokes, you find it's, it's extremely difficult. Well, one thing which is extremely difficult um, has to be extremely difficult because. One problem is that Euler is time reversible and Navier Stokes is not. So, anytime that you have a solution of Euler, you can just apply a simple transformation and trade time for negative time. And of course, if you produce a solution which is dissipating the kinetic energy, this means there is a mirror solution which is increasing the kinetic energy. And there's no way you can approximate that with a sequence of classical solutions on Navier Stokes for which the kinetic energy has to go down. Um, there's even more severe problems. So in these convex integration constructions, we can actually prescribe the kinetic energy which is going up and down. And so at that point, these guys cannot be approximated by solution of the stokes irrespective of which direction of time you actually choose. OK, now on the other hand, smooth solution of order are approximable by smooth solution of the stokes but in that case, anomalous dissipation would require a blow up of order. Yeah, you know, it took me years to, before I understood this phrase anomalous dissipation. Can, can you break it down? It's, it's, you know, the, the English phrase is too complicated. It's got a long noun and a long action. <laughs> anomalous dissipation is exactly what I said, for me, is exactly what I said before. The sequence of solutions of Navier Stokes with a viscosity which is going to zero and for which the rate of dissipation of the kinetic energy is bounded away from zero, independently of zero. That's what I understand as anomalous dissipation. And Without the, introducing these oscillations so on the, the initial data. supposed to converge to something? No, I'm not even asking you that the sequence converges. Oh, just a sequence? Just a sequence, but I'm asking you that you don't put oh. a lot of oscillation in the initial data. Okay, so the sequence of initial data, I don't know, stick to the same initial data, for instance, or if you want to change the initial data, compact subset of L2, let's say. And the viscosity is going to zero, and the yes. dissipation stays not away from zero. Yes, the dissipation stays not away from zero. That's anomalous dissipation. No, yeah, so I mean, in a sense, you would say it's anomalous because if I do it on the linear equation, I'm not seeing anything. If I apply the heat equation, I'm not seeing any dissipation. I'm just converging to something which, which is constant uh, energy. OK, so now I actually want cons to consider a slightly different question. So let me allow you to put a force in term. Now, you are exactly in the same situation. So you are not allowed to put a lot of oscillation in the force in term, but you're still asking if by putting a force in term, you can find a dissipation which wouldn't be present if you draw the nonlinear term. Okay? You face a very similar situation. So, so put a forcing term. Yeah. 
Now, don't put oscillations in the forcing term in a way that would the heat equation dissipate. So imagine you cancel this, OK? Yeah. And you look at the corresponding sequence of solutions for the heat equation. OK, that should not display any anomalous dissipation. So I just go down. I converge to something which has the energy balance that you expect from the leap from, 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 from dropping the viscosity term. Of course, the energy balance would just have a, a term which is energy. Yeah. I'm putting energy, but, but it's not, I mean, like the system is not dissipating more energy than you're actually doing by multiplying FK with the solution UK. Okay? It becomes, I mean, it is anomalous if I actually find that in the limit, I'm dissipating more than what I am igniting here, mm -hmm. this FK. Okay? And again, like before, I don't allow you to produce oscillations in the FK, right? So, and, and the way to understand this is if you do it on the heat equation, nothing is happening. So one way would be just to say that this FK is strongly compact in L2, for instance, okay? So then the heat equation wouldn't do anything bad. And you face a very similar, you face a very similar issue as in the other uh, situation. So, if you start with a, I mean, if your forces are bounded in a reasonable class, you're converging to a classical solution of order, and you don't see any dissipation. And the reasonable class is C1 alpha, so, or, you know, a little bit better than C1, or a little bit better than Lipschitz. So as soon as you are above that, you are converging to classical solutions of order. As soon as you are below that, there is no PDE reason why you couldn't converge to some solution of order which dissipates. Okay. Below what? Below what? Below the C1 alpha. Below C1. Yes, below C1. So let's say C alpha, for instance. And. So see, all these talks are related. C1 was in the other talk. Yes. <laughs> so here, for instance, it tells you what about if I take FK in C alpha with alpha less than 1? then obviously the heat equation is not going to make uh, any dissipation more than it should do, and maybe the Nadia Stokes does. And that's exactly the theorem that we prove. So that's the theorem that um, Elia Boué and I could prove last year. So you can find the sequence of viscosities which are going to zero, the sequence of forces which are smooth, and a single initial data. Oh, and are the FK staying in a yes. compact? Yes. So, exactly, I'm, I'm coming to that. Yeah. So, you're, you're solving the force Nagel Stokes equations, and you have a unique smooth solution for each of these guys. It's not obvious, but for that particular forcing, you actually have a unique smooth solution. The energy dissipation is bounded away from zero. But the Hölder norms of FK is uniformly bounded. And actually, the solutions are even bounded themselves, but in any field. Okay? So essentially, we're just saying that if you allow me to cheat and put a forcing, I can just tell you that what is the well Posner's threshold, which is C1, is exactly the threshold for telling you that there cannot be a phenomenon like this on a short time. And it can actually occur if you go below that threshold. Right, that was a little complicated. So, you say it again? So, if you assume a little bit more than this, so if you assume C1 plus something, this is not going to happen. Oh, At least not for a sufficiently small time. Yeah. I mean, you have to wait for a blow up of oil to, for that to happen. Exactly if you stay a little bit below, then it might happen. And that's why we are saying this is an example of anomalous dissipation for the forced time situations. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit of the ideas in, 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 that, that go into the proof. So first of all, we're actually looking at two plus one half flows. What, what does it mean? So we're looking at special solutions of the stokes They depend only on the first two variables. So I'm, I'm calling the third variable rho k which is a little bit unfortunate because, you know, there is... Oh, so this is in right. so, two dimensions? Yes, it's in, it's in two and a half dimensions. So I have 
The first two components and even the third component of the velocity, which depends only on the first two variables, but the third component of the velocity is still non-trivial. So it's not exactly a two-dimensional flow. That's why it's called two and a half. The third component depends on the first two. The third component com depends also on the first two variables, but what is important is non-zero. It's non-zero. Non For a two-dimensional flow, the third component would be identically equal to zero, and the first two would only depend on the first two variables. OK, so the third component of the velocity solves a linear parabolic equation at that point. So the idea that we had would be let me produce first the force fk for which this vector field is behaving in a certain way and then hope that the dissipation, the anomalous dissipation is actually concentrated or is actually ignited by this linear equation which we understand very well. Wait, k is the index of the sequence. Yes, k is what the is index UK? of the sequence. UK is that up UK there. is that the thing. UK is the two-dimensional component. So yeah. your three-dimensional vector has a two-dimensional component and the third dimensional. And for some reason the third dimensional became from rho k became theta k. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. Okay. So rho this one should be theta k. Yeah. So the nonlinearity drops. I mean, there is no interaction of theta k with itself somehow. That's the nice thing. So it's true that there is a nonlinearity here and there is a nonlinearity here, but you can solve, first of all, two-dimensional Navier-Stokes to find uk. And then once you know uk, there's a linear parabolic equation for theta k, which as uk goes to 0 becomes a linear transport equation for theta k. So we do not force the third component. OK, so formally theta k converges to a transport equation. And you want to use the force fk to produce a relatively harmless 2D vector field uk, which is under control. So it actually converges nicely to a solution of Euler. But even though this uk is relatively harmless, it produces a badly behaved transport equation. That's what we want to do. I mean, that's badly behaved. That's going to be badly behaved, yes. And I'm just going to um, tell you in a second how it's going to be badly behaved. So now, I'm, I'm just switching to transport equations. Um, so you're just assuming you're following uh, the flow of a vector field, right? So it's the usually ordinary differential equations. And cauchy lipschitz or, or picard lindelof depending, depending on when you are, tells you that if u is Lipschitz in space, then there is a unique trajectory, right? And that is the theorem. Uh, and not only that, um, the solution gamma depends continuously on both the initial data x and the vector field u, which means that if you build the flow map, uh, this flow map is a one-parameter family of by Lipschitz homeomorphisms, right? Which is, in fact, isotopic to the identity. So they're Lipschitz, they're bijective, they have a Lipschitz inverse, and Phi becomes more and more regular according to the duality of u, of course. So, so this is all classical stuff. OK, now, um, the Jacobian determinant of the uh, differential of the flow is actually solving the Uville equation, right? That's the theorem by Uville, which also tells you that if the divergence of u is equal to 0, then the flow is measured in zero. In general, if you have a bound on the divergence, of course, you have Longo's lemma, which is telling you that the uh, flow has a bound, a two-sided bound on the complexivity. So there's a very well, of course, there's a very elegant way of um, um, encoding this Liouville theorem. So if you take the push forward of the measure, for which I give you a formal definition over here, but maybe this was not needed. Uh, a way a to understand. Yes, okay, a way to <laughs> so a way to understand the UV theorem is just to say that when you push forward the Lebesgue measure you get the density and the density solves the continuity equation. Okay. And the continuity equation in our case where the divergence of u is equal to zero is actually the transport equation, and the transport equation again this is something some computation that I shouldn't have done over here, but you know, it's over there, so the transport equation, which comes from elementary calculus, 
is equivalent to say that the function u, e, the function rho, is constant along the, the characteristics. Okay. So now here is a very uh, uh, interesting question. So how much can you relax the Lipschitz condition and still have a notion of like you know flow, which makes some sense. So it is known, and this is called the Bernalion's theory, and for, for guys like me in PG, it's a very exciting, it was a very exciting theory, and it's a very useful theory, that if you're still clinging to one derivative, but you relax the summability, instead of being Lipschitz, you're just LP, or in the limiting case, you are a function of bounded variation, which means that the derivative is a Radon measure, then, um, if you avoid technicalities that, that are concerning spatial infinity, you can actually have the following theorem, which tells you that if u is sub of f and divergence of u is bounded, in our case divergence of u is equal to, equal to zero, there exists a reasonable but just measurable flow phi, which is unique and is stable under approximations. So, so this means it's a family of bijections uh, in the measure theory sense. Yes, in a measure theory sense. Exactly. And I'm just going to tell you exactly what, it, what, 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 what I mean by reasonable flow. Well, so wait. here... Can, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So what do you say? L1 or W? Can, can you repeat again this part? So, uh, ignore time. Like, uh -huh. you know, time is yeah. kind of a technical thing. A little bit like in Lipschitz theory, right? I mean, in time, you're not assuming anything, essentially. Mm -hmm. So ignore time. If you're w one p on autonomous vector field, for instance, or if you are a function of bounded variation, which means the derivative of your uh, vector field is a measure, so it has kind of co-dimension one discontinuities, essentially. Yeah. And if you assume a bound of the divergence, for instance, you assume divergence free, then there is a very well, uh, there is a, a, a very good notion of what is the flow of the ODE. In the following sense, if you smooth your vector field, then you compute the classical flow, the classical flow is converging to this limiting flow, but this limiting flow is only measure theoretic. So it's only an invertible map in the sense of measure theory, for instance. Well, let me tell you exactly, and it's locally compact, this family of flows, as you vary the W1P, locally compact in L1, right? In a measure theoretic sense. Now let me give you what is a reasonable flow. A reasonable flow is that for almost every x, Gamma of t equal phi of t x is an absolutely continuous curve. So you're not going to have curves which jump somehow. You solve the ODE you as... Continuous means continuous and you can integrate its derivative. Yes, and you integrate its derivative, you get the, the guy. The derivative solves the ODE in the way you would like it to solve now for almost every t. And since it's absolutely continuous, it's, as, as you're saying, I mean, it's consistent. I mean, like, you know, that, that you, can, you can compute the um, trajectory once you know the derivative point wise, even though you know it, on the, you know it on, only almost everywhere. But then there's a third axiom. And the third axiom is that it tells you, uh, yes, here, that the push forward of the Lebesgue measure through this is bounded. So it's absolutely continuous and bounded for a locally bounded function. So now this is a strange axiom, right? Because, so if you, if you have A, B, and C, you call them regular Lagrangian flows. So that's a, stra it's, it's a strange axiom because in the classical setting, for instance, if you're divergence free, that is not an axiom. That's a theorem, right? The flow is measure preserving. So, and there was a lingering question about this theory. So is this condition C really, uh, I can't point anymore. So is it really needed, or is it just an artifact of the theory that we're imposing it? And so as a side remark, let me tell you, so there's, it, it was only settled very recently. So there's a, um, 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 a result by Karalena, Kripa, and Japan in 2020. So if the summability P is bigger than the dimension of the space, then there is, for almost every initial data, there is a unique trajectory of the ODE, a unique, absolutely continuous ODE. And so your regular Lagrangian flow does not need the Liouville axiom, because there's only one way of moving around. But if you are actually for P below N, there is a divergence free vector fields U in W1P with the following property. There's a set of uh, uh, I mean, no matter how you define u on a set of measure 0, because p is less than n, so it's not continuous, 
you can always find a closed set of positive measures such that when you start the ODE with values, with initial data on that set, you find at least two absolutely continuous trajectories. Mm -hmm. So there is the regular Lagrangian flow, which is picking up one trajectory for you, and there is another flow which is picking up the wrong trajectory, and that flow must violate the axiom C. So it's not respecting the Ubik theorem, because if it were respecting the Ubik theorem, it would have to coincide with the, leg, with the regular Lagrangian flow. So it's actually a necessary axiom. And the third case? P equal N? Open. open, open, so... Likely, I mean, there's some evidence for it. So, okay, uh, if it is a little bit better than ln uh, at the logarithmic scale, <coughs> then we can prove there is a unique uh, trajectory for almost every x. So, now, what I actually want to get to, and um, I, I will show you how this is linked to uh, my initial question, is, is it possible to go beyond the Sobolev regularity in the De Bruyne theory? Can you remind me what Sobolev regularity is? Uh, one derivative in LP. So now, what do I mean I go below? So I give up one derivative, so I, I, I have a fraction of a derivative. Now, what do I mean by fraction of derivative? Well, you can go to Fourier, um, transform and whatever, but for the sake of this talk, just think Hölder. Okay, so Hölder, Hölder one half is the best space of functions for which I have a half derivative, in a sense. Okay? Um, so now, if you open a textbook example, it would tell you immediately, like, you know, all these in one space dimension, you're not nicely well posed if you take something like square root of, uh, uh, I mean, gamma dot equals square root of gamma. Okay? But that example is in some sense fake, because in one dimension, I really want to look at flow which are measure preserving, or at least, you know, nearly incompressible, so with some bound on the divergence. And if I impose that on one dimensional flows, of course, in one dimensional flow, there's only one partial derivative. And if I tell you that that one has to be equal to zero, the situation is trivial. Or if I tell you that that has to be bounded, the situation is slip sheets. Okay? So, can you go below but keep the divergence condition? And it's absolutely not uh, um, clear. So there's a first example of non-unique solution for the, okay, so one thing which I didn't tell you is the following. So in this, the Bernalion's theory, essentially any time you get a reasonable example of, I mean, a reasonable stability, existence, and uniqueness of the regular Lagrangian flow, you get an equally reasonable existence and uniqueness of solutions for the transport and continuity equation. So for me, the two things are really related. So is there a unique like, regular Lagrangian flow? Is there a unique solution of the transport equation? And so there, is a, there was a first example of a divergence-free vector field, which is due to Eisenman in 1978, for which the continuity equation, or the transport equation, if you want, because this is divergence-free, is not well posed. But now I'm going to actually show you a really beautiful and simple example by the Paul in 2003. So here's what we're going to do. So take this vector field over here. Um, so you have to imagine that this is actually repeated around in a, um, a checkerboard fashion, right? So there are like boarding squares in which everything stays put. And then there is this vector field over here on each square. So this vector field is just has the following, has just has, has the following feature. It simply rotates each square counterclockwise by 90 degrees at time, say, one half. Okay? That's all it's doing. Okay. So now, I'm going to feed the, uh, 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 so I'm going to take this vector field, which is piecewise smooth, and has nice, I mean, it has these continuities, but they're very nice, so I'm not going to worry about that, with a function, an initial value, uh, a function which takes the values 1 and minus 1 on the dyadic squares in a checkerboard fashion. But pay attention. So these squares over here, Right? I mean, you see over there, that square is really centered on the origin. Now, the new checkerboard fashion is done in such a way that your, uh, um, your coordinates of the squares are on the integral lattice. Okay? And now I flow the initial data for from time 0 to time 1 half. So here is what is happening, right? So here I have my checkerboard fashion. 
So the function is 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. And then I'm acting with this flow, right, on these skewed squares. So once I wait time 1 half, this one has rotated by 90 degrees, and so I find this check and point pattern. Okay? Okay, now you see what I want to do. So now I'm going to do the same. I'm going to just going to do the same with the same vector field, but between time 1 half and 3 quarter. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. So this is what actually happens to your uh, initial data. So now I do it with uh, v1x equal v of 2x. So I'm just like, you know, repeating the, 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 the vector field at um, half the scale. And now I'm refining the, I'm refining the, um, the, uh, the checkerboard by uh, a half again, but I need half the time that I had actually before. I mean, I need one quarter time to do that. Okay, and I do it in the time interval <coughs> One half, three quarters. Sorry. On that, okay. At, at time three quarters, I get rho initial times four x. I mean, computing on four x. So I, I keep doing it. Okay. I keep doing it at each time, and now I fit this to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, transport equation. So I homogenize every time I go actually closer to one. I homogenize, 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 homogenize. At a certain point, I converge to the function which is identically equal to zero, right? Because my average is equal to zero on smaller and smaller squares. Could you show the picture again? I want to take a picture of it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now, go backward in time, right? So you started with some initial data which is reasonable, and you actually landed in zero. So go backward in time now. Reverse. You actually are zero, and you produce something. That obviously is not a good sign, because the function which was identically equal to zero was a solution. So now you could ask, Okay, so this is what I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you. So you're essentially homogenizing everything, right? And now I'm reversing time, and I, the function identically equal to zero was also a solution. So you could actually ask, how regular is this vector field that I've taken? And I'm not going to give you the computation, but a computation uh, which, I, which, which can be done, is it tells you that it has uh, uh, a fractional derivative for a fraction arbitrarily close to 1. It fails to be a function of bounded variation, but it's a w alpha p function for every p less than some. Maybe it's, it's still, you could say, well, it sort of sucks anyhow, because you know I have all these discontinuities. OK, so I don't think I'm actually getting to that on time, because it's on slide something like 44 or so, and I am going. Um, definitely uh, over time, but actually the example can be made C alpha. So for every alpha less than one, the example can be made in that way. And I just want to mention that maybe at the very end, by skipping the motivation, what, 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 um, what, what, how much damage can be done. So now, back to the Navier-Stokes flow. What do I want to do? Well, I want to do the following thing. I want to look at two plus one half flows with that structure. And I'm hoping that I find a forcing term over here, which makes a behavior like the one of the depot flow. And then I want to put the depot flow over here. Ideally, k is the time at which I truncate the depot flow, same. And everything is kind of well behaved. Look at the, uh, uh, look at the um, um, parabolic equation and telling you and tell you that, you know, it's making this dissipation, this anomalous dissipation. So now, you should be screaming at me for a lot of reasons. I promised you fk is c alpha, and your depot flow was actually like, you know, piecewise, discontinuous, I mean, it's kind of messy. So there's lots of things that you have to take care of. So first of all, you want some smooth replacement for this kind of, you know, rotation, mixer, whatever. And it actually exists. And it has been constructed by, um, sorry, Alberti, Crippa, and Matsukato in 2016. So that takes care of having, I mean, of the fact that there are the discontinuities. Okay? 
Now, you want to prove that there is energy dissipation, but now this guy is a smooth mixer. It's not quite really the ideal situation that we had before. So there are lots of errors that you have to take into account. And proving that there is dissipation in the uh, uh, transport equation is actually non-trivial. We exploit an idea of uh, Drivas and Gindi Ear and Gion, 2019. Now, you also maybe remember that my flow was kind of viscated each time, but kept at the same fixed time. OK, that is because I wanted to use the dynamic scale 2 to the minus k. So if I enlarge the time scaling a little bit more, and instead of insisting on having times which are like 2 to the minus k, I get actually times which are 1 over k squared, I don't need to go so fast in the mixing. I can actually go slower and slower and slower. And in particular, I can take care of like, you know, converging in C0, but actually even converging in C alpha. Um, now, what is the upshot? Why my function fk can actually be taken further? Well, essentially what I'm just going to do is something very dumb. So I know what is the vector field that I want to produce. So I stick it into the Navier-Stokes operator, and I compute what gets out. And that I call force. So now I have to actually have bound for this force fk. And what is most dangerous is actually this bilinear term. And what is happening? Because the, the Laplacian is actually multiplied by nu k, which hopefully I can keep under control. Maybe I make smaller and smaller. So what is really making, uh, I mean, what is the fun part of this is that that term is bilinear, so it's nonlinear, which typically, when you want to prove something like well postness or whatever, is what is creating all the mess. But I'm actually taking advantage in the, in the following sense. When I repeat my construction at smaller and smaller scales, I can make this very small, because I'm taking very large times, actually, even though the derivative of uk actually is relatively large. So the product of the two actually stays under control. For instance, it stays uniformly bounded. But in fact, it stays uniformly C alpha if you carry on computations more carefully. OK, so um, uh, there's a series of tantalizing open questions. I mean, can you actually make this force fk independent of the viscosity? We don't know how to do that. Can you make it time independent? Well, there's a cheap way of doing that if you go one dimension up. Because like, you know, if you have a non-autonomous vector field for a flow in dimension d, you can transform it into a, an autonomous in dimension d plus 1. But we don't know how to do anything like that in dimension 3. Can we make it disappear if I actually take a dimension which is huge? Uh, it's like, OK, so for instance, there's um, this theorem by Terry Tao, which tells you that you know, if you go very high up in the dimension and you allow for a different angle manifold, uh, you can actually embed any type of dynamics. Actually, it's not a theorem of Terry Tao. It's a conjecture of Terry Tao, which has been proved by and now I've forgotten the name very recently. Yes, yes. Uh, no, not Peralta. He's a student of him, I think. Paco. Uh, yes, but Paco yeah. is the first name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Of course, you could just say, like, hey, I just want to embed a certain particular dynamics in oil. Yeah, the catch is that the dynamics that I want to embed is very non smooth. And what you can actually embed in there, in very high dimension, is a smooth dynamics. Uh, can you make an Onsager type conjecture for the forced Navier Stokes equations now and prove it really for something which is a limit of Navier Stokes? Yeah, that you can do. And it's this joint work under five names. Um, OK, and um, well. Uh, now, thank you for your attention. Is the last slide. <laughs> sometimes I feel we never will understand it. Sometimes I feel like we're first year calculus students and we can understand it. We <laughs> make instructions, right? Check the boards and stuff. Fractal. Right. Are there any questions for Camila? I don't think it's worth superconducting fluids at all. Sorry? Have you looked at superconducting fluids? 
Um, no, not really. So all of this is uh, very new. Yeah, because they have no viscosity at all. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yes, I. Mm -hmm. It's not superconductive, it's superfluidic. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. It's their quantum. It's a different story. <laughs> they have quantum coherence, macroscopic. Right. How close does water come to satisfying the conditions you have had at the beginning? Water moving slowly or something? Conservation of mass and, um, and conservation of momentum in that sense? Yeah. Yeah, pretty close. Pretty close. So what about fr friction? And friction, no, yeah. No, no, no friction. But, I mean, if it's going, I mean, if it's, if it's not moving too fast, Iron is a pretty good approximation. It's not such a bad approximation. It's radiant, it's not, yeah. yeah, it's not such a bad approximation. Of course, it depends on it depends on the speed. Okay. I mean, all of this you can always say it depends on. You know, the, the water flowing in the East River. Yeah, I mean, all that. So I'm not the right person probably to ask this. So it's like, of course, all of this is a mathematical idealization. At a certain point, you know, at a certain scale, uh, uh, the continuum mechanics is not valid anymore. So. Um, it is three where it works perfectly. Sorry? It is three where flow described as this equation is a, you know, QSC 10 to minus 18, 17. It's pretty good. And what you say? That it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least river there's a boundary also. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. All in the periodic torus. This is all in the periodic torus, <laughs> which is kind of a hard, um, like, you know, Example to beat. <laughs> well, in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I mean, of, of, of course, um, neglecting boundary conditions. Uh, by the way, so I, sh I sh maybe just let me cite that. So, um, so, um, when I went back, so when I went back to uh, the imposeness of the transport equation, right? I told you this, there is a construction which can be done with C alpha vector fields. So this was done very recently. So it's this three orders Colombo, Pippa, and Sorella last year. And so for every C alpha, you can get an example of a C alpha vector field, which is divergence free, for which the transport equation is imposed. Now, it's imposed in a very dramatic way. The, the transport equation is what? For which the transport no equation is imposed. No problem. Now, it's imposed in a very dramatic way. So, for instance, if you smooth your vector field by a given convolution kernel, depending on the size of the kernel going to zero, so if, I don't know, you take a certain sequence or you take a certain other sequence, you're converging to two different solutions, okay? So it's really like dramatically, I, I mean, there's no coherent way of approximating it. And even worse, if you make a parabolic regularization for that particular, like, you know, bad vector fields, depending on the viscosity that you put, for a certain sequence of viscosity, you're converging to a certain solution, and for a certain sequence of viscosity, you're converging to another solution. And this is C alpha. So in some sense, at least all the kind of you know, modern mechanisms in PDEs with which you would desire to prove a certain stability of your flow fails as soon as you give up one derivative. Okay? Uh, just a tiny bit less, stay divergence free. Uh, there's no way of defining a reasonable notion of flow or a reasonable notion of solution of the transport equation, which is stable and a reasonable approximation. And I mean, the most reasonable approximation one can think of is like smoothing by a single kernel or smoothing with a parabolic smoothing, which is like epsilon times the Well, can I play the devil's advocate? Yes. So suppose, I mean, the transport equation I think of is like you have some flow and you put in some chi, and then you see where the die goes. Yes. In, that and in some sense, that's all we care about in real life. We want to know how much, how fast cancer spreads, how fast. Yep pollution spreads and stuff like that. So it's very important equations, right? But on the other hand, I, I remember as an undergraduate loving this theorem of Cauchy. Mm -hmm. Every continuous vector field has solutions. 
But of course, they're not unique. So you can That's Peano. Huh? That's Peano. It's not Pushing. Who? Peano. Peano? Okay. Yes, Peano. I mean, I mean, Peano is a port. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Pushing doesn't do that. Oh, no, no, it's an Italian guy. Well, it's important. <laughs> 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 Yes. Non -unique yes. They start out tangent and then they just spread. Yes. It's a nice picture, right? Yes. So now, if you, if that theorem were augmented with a probability, like you, with one half you go this way and one half yes. you go that way, if there are three of them, maybe you do one third, one third, one third, yes. or something like that, then you could still compute yes. the diffusion of the die. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need this fundamental uniqueness theorem. If, from the point of view of diffusion, that's the devil's advocate. So we, should, but we do need to have a probability distribution on which which track to go on. And right. I don't know a theorem. S so there's a theorem like that. Huh? There is a theorem like that. Okay, who's that? So that is called that is called Ambrosio's superposition principle. So that tells you the following. So if you give a divergence-free LP vector field. Uh, well, it's not even continuous. Uh, it's not even continuous. No, no. And you look at a positive solution of the transport equation. That positive solution can be written as um, a superposition. So, like you know, you you it, it's 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 like an integral uh, over a probability measure of solutions which are transported by different flows. And he finds the measure. That you integrate you produce that? Well, uh, so here's the problem. Depending on which solution you're giving him, he's producing a different measure. Oh, okay. Right? I want to have one measure that works for all transfers. But that's impossible, right? So because it is a linear equation. So say that you find two different so say that you find two different flows. You transport according to one flow and you transport no, no, according to the, the other flow. flow. Given the vector field, I want to find the measure that yeah. will give weight to the solutions. But it's impossible to find something that gives weight to all the solutions, because as soon as you have two solutions, as soon as you have two, as soon as you have no uniqueness, you can just take lambda times one plus one minus lambda times the other. And that equivalent is, is equivalent to take... Well, I want to select one. I mean, oh, well. uh, okay, now if you want to select one, that's, that, there you see why my, my theorem, I mean, not my theorem, but the theorem of, um, of my friends over there is so relevant. How do you select that? I mean, if you select it by smoothness, you, by smoothing, you have to tell me which type of smoothing, and the most reasonable type of smoothing that actually leads you to do to two different solutions. To do what? To two different solutions. Oh. From, you know, a one parameter. So the theorem of Ambrosio just tells you, you give him the solution, is going to find a probability measure on the space of flows, which sort of reproduces that solution. But of course, probability measure can, can't be unique because as soon as you have, you know, say, so there's two different flows in the sense of Peano, say, uh, Dennis' flow and Camilo's flow. So I can decide to go half with probability half with Dennis and with probability half with me, and then I produce one solution. But if we go like two thirds and one third, then I've produced another solution. I like the second one better. <laughs> you like the second one better? Yeah. Well, of course, there's always. So there's always a criterion for a reasonable flow. So like, you know, you come to me and I'm telling you which flow is reasonable. <laughs> I'm not sure you want to do that each time. Right? It becomes even boring. We can solve this, we can solve this problem for y in time velocity, which is especially non-smooth, that it has all this non-uniqueness, but you can find a measure. And this measure is just, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have delta function of initial data, namely it's spreading. But for white in time velocity, you can find it. Yeah, so these guys are kind of pretty reasonable in time, actually. The unreasonability is in space. And in some sense, these theorems are telling you that there's not much you can, there's not much way of remedying that. Yes? Uh, in, in general, how good is, how good an approximation is the Euler equation? for uh, the Navier Stokes equations with small viscosity. They seem to have like very different behavior. Uh. Um, 
with no boundary conditions. So if you have some uniform bounds on your sequence, then it's a reasonable approximation. And essentially, if the derivative of your vector field is under control, then it's a reasonable approximation. That is what the PDE theory more or less tells you. Okay. I mean, this PDE theory that tells you, okay, if you are C1 alpha, so if your derivative is alpha holder, you have a sequence of C1 alpha solutions of Navier Stokes, you're converging to a C1 alpha solution of Euler, and not only that, there's a unique one as long as you don't have a blow up of that point. So over that interval, there is a unique one, and your Navier Stokes is converging to it. So that is reasonable. Okay. But in some sense, what, what, what the PDE theory is suggesting you is as soon as you go below that, so as soon as the derivative of the, of the velocity starts being like messy, uh, then it might not be. And the actual theorems that we have are telling you if the velocity v is only further continuous and not too much further, then certainly it's not a good approximation. Okay, does that happen? Frequently, like when you're working with that. Uh, well, what does it mean? Uh, it happens frequently, like you know this. Um, so this theorem, which tells you that um, solutions of Euler might dissipate the energy or might increase the energy, um, means that I'm producing energy out of nothing, which I'm sure lots of people would appreciate. But I don't think it has any practical implication. I meant like as a working mathematician. Like, oh, as a working mathematician. Like in your day-to-day -day life. In my day-to-day -day life, no, in my day-to-day -day life, I spent like years trying to produce such monsters. So I, you know, <laughs> I had half time producing them. So I don't see myself as like encountering them that, that often, right? But, but okay, so this, this 1949 paper by Larson Sager, it's actually postulating it exists. This 1949 paper by Larson Sager is asserting, say, back, 73 years ago that this stuff exists way even before we are just defi defining solutions in the sense of distributions or like you know but he whatever did it by a physical scaling argument or he did it by simply saying okay uh, if Kolmogorov's theory has to be true at arbitrarily small viscosity then I could even just put viscosity equal to zero and find uh, uh, in anomalous dissipation or some dissipative solution directly on the other equations. For less than Holder a third velocity. Yes, for that for less than Holder a third velocity. And I mean the, the threshold has some explanation from the from, from the statistical theory of turbulence. Now day to day I it's a, it's a difficult definition. I have a stupid question. I saw in one of the slides that you didn't show us, I saw quickly appear final cuts. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so these guys, uh, these guys that I'm claiming over here, right? They're showing you that there are crazy solutions of this. So solutions that, depending on how you approximate your vector field, or how you put the viscosity, depending on the amount of viscosity, they're converging to two different solutions of transport equations. Okay, so the mechanism, okay, the basic mechanism, uh, um, which we, we, I had first with a student of mine, something like this. So assume you, assume you, you take a vector field which is doing this, mi this mixing, which I showed you, this default. And then truncate it at a certain time and then put it back. And like, you know, unwind all your cows. So then you're converging to a solution which is time symmetric. So it's like you know homogenizing the checkerboard, getting to zero, and then dehomogenizing them. But now you can do the following uh, um, um, like you know funky thing. So go from scale one to k in your dehomogenization, and the, in the dehomogenization, skip the first scale. So start at scale k minus one. Then you're not reconstructing anything actually, so you keep being homogenized. So in this way, you have essentially in the limit the same vector field because you just see all the homogenization and all the dehomogenization, and one solution is converging to the homogenized guy, and the other solution is converging to like you know the time symmetric. Now these guys are able to embed such a behavior in this um, in this uh, um, uh, parabolic equation depending on which viscosity you use. 
And in one of the steps of the proof, they are using Feynman cuts to actually make estimates on how close is the uh, parabolic to one of the two kind of slightly different approximation of your vector fields. That's where it, it actually happens. So to deal to deal with this. Well, they use a Feynman cuts formula. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They use a Feynman cuts formula. Yes. It's it's a beautiful picture. Well, actually, one of their referees complained, saying, like, you know, why are we using Feynman cuts? It's probably not, it's probably not really necessary, but I'm, I don't know. Yeah, it looks beautiful to me, anyway, the idea. Is there a philosophical point? Uh, that, that gives you clar clarity on this? Like, you look at it, is there a way of looking at it so it's more sensible? For the philosophical point for what? For, for, for he wants to explain it. I, yeah, I don't understand it very well, but it seems like it's, very, it's but, very, very, very rich and very, very, you know, hard, hard to understand. You know, it's very. This. Uh, you seem to be so. So after hundreds of these years, people are now producing counterexamples to really fundamental questions. Is that, is that your point? Um. Well, the, uh, the boundary between truth and non-truth. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm the good person to ask a philosophical question. But I, like, I don't, Can you give I don't some... think I understand it myself to extract a philosophical answer. Well, not a philosophical answer to everything, but can you maybe why did the Feynman path integrals show up? Even oh, why in there? Yeah. In there proof. Well, it's a way. I mean, it's it's. Um, well, okay, so that is a very natural way of uh, keeping track of, well, I mean, if the viscosity was not there, right, the transport equation would just mean you compute the stupid characteristic via the ODE, and then you know where your particle is going, right? I mean, the feynman scatz formula is a way of, you know, making something like that or an approximation of that for the parabolic regularization. That's the way I understand it. So with the diffusion. With the diffusion, yes. I mean, it's a way of, and so you can see that it's a kind of natural way that you want to use to compare the parabolic equation to the transport equation. 